Hi, my name is Andrew Meeks, Chief Investment Officer for Six Meridian. Thank you for joining us today, Monday, October 19th, to discuss our market outlook and discuss what's happened over the last few months. It's been an interesting year so far. Uh, it feels like anything that could happen has happened in 2020, and I think some of us are ready for 21 uh, to get here. So today I want to talk about the economy, where we were, where we are, a little bit about what we see happening uh, going forward. I want to talk about COVID and the virus and, and what we anticipate that, how that impacts investors over the next several months, and then talk about the election, which is obviously dominating right now the, the media cycle, and then finally talk about the financial markets, where we see opportunities, and what's gone on so far this year. Start with the economy. Uh, we had the quickest bear market in the financial markets. We've had the quickest recession, and we've had a very quick bounce back. And talk about the, the reason for that is the, the health of the consumer, which might seem counterintuitive given how much unemployment there is out in the economy. Uh, and that leads right into stimulus, how important that has been so far, and then how important we think that is going forward. And then finally, what we think is a, is a bubbling risk, and that's a pickup in inflation um, for the upcoming couple of years. This chart is, does a good job, I think, of showing the magnitude of the drawdown we saw in the economy. If you look at the blue line, that's the developed markets, the yellow is emerging markets. And the developed markets, uh, you see how far we came down. And this chart shows you the 08, 09 financial crisis, which was a, a terrible recession. And it took much longer to come out of that. If you see this is almost a V-shaped recovery in terms of the contraction and then the response or the bounce back that we saw coming out of that. This is a, another uh, collection of charts that show us what was going on inside the economy, and they both have V patterns. On the left is industrial production, which still has a ways to go to get back to where we were uh, coming into this. Uh, there's certainly elements of the economy that are, that are still struggling to, to recover. But on the right, you see real retail sales, which have actually set a new record um, coming, out of, uh, coming out of this recession. And the reason for that is because the consumer, their balance sheet actually, uh, or their income statement more so than their balance sheet, their income statement uh, held up pretty well. And the, if you look at the orange line at the top, you see that's total personal income. So that include, includes income from work and then also government transfer payments. And it has a pretty uh, steady uh, incline upward since 2005. You see uh, spikes here and there. But what we saw here is that immediately going into the recession, personal income actually spiked. And you'll see below personal income from compensation took a dip, but total personal income went up. And that's due to unemployment payments, the household uh, uh, thousand or $1,500 checks that went out to households. And so there was a lot of cash flooding the system, allowing consumers to maintain their lifestyle so that they wouldn't get kicked out of their houses. They would still be able to spend on, uh, on different things that they needed. But some of those are coming to an end, specifically the unemployment insurance payments, uh, which is a big part of the stimulus negotiation going on right now between Congress and the White House. And you see that this graphic shows you that they have uh, stepped down pretty significantly. This is a monthly chart um, starting with January, February, March, and then you see April picks up, May, June, July, uh, big pickups, and then August we saw the big drop off. The, the need for additional unemployment benefits, I think, is clear. There are a lot of people out of work purely because the virus has made whatever they used to do for a living not, not viable. I think people who work in movie theaters, uh, certainly on any type of hospitality industry, the airline industry, et cetera. So that's going to have to have uh, – that's going to have to be addressed when they finally get around to getting a, a, a new stimulus package underway. This shows you the, uh, the economic data surprise index. And what you see is that the economic data was very negative at the beginning part of the year, but it's kind of similar to what happened in 08. What's the, the real shocker is how much better it has been coming out of it. Everybody, every forecaster, every smart person underestimated how quickly we'd get a snap back out of this. We, we did, I mean, I just think everybody did. That's why you see this, the magnitude of it. But it is starting to come off and uh, we're, we're gonna have to we have to have another stimulus package in place because there's just simply a destruction of so much of our economic activity that, uh, that, that we're gonna need for that to come in, come back into play. 
Now talking about the, at the end of that, the, the follow on is what happens with all this money that gets pumped into the economy. Uh, there's a good argument, I think, to be made that inflation could pick up in 21 and 22 and beyond. And you have the leader of the Federal Reserve uh, basically saying that's what we want. And this is a quote that he he made with regards to his desire for inflation to pick up and to be probably a little bit above their, their target rate of 2%. And to the extent that he's successful, I think people are going to look back and say how crazy it was that you were able to uh, that the government was able to borrow money at, at less than 1% when the head of the Federal Reserve is saying, we want inflation to be well above 2%. So you have a negative real yield right out of the gate. And with regards to inflation, the other thing, if you remember back to your Econ 101, uh, where Milton Freeman said inflation is always and everywhere a, a, a result of money, uh, too much money supply. And right here is the M2 money supply, which is a good measure for how much money is in circulation. And you see it's a, a very clear, steady upward trend. And that's been uh, the case if we took this chart back even further. We've never seen such a rapid step up in the money supply uh, here, in, here in the United States. It's just it's unprecedented. And it's due to all that money getting basically just flooded into the financial system. And so I think that that could be a, a little bit of a, a precursor to increased inflation um, inside the economy as well, because a lot of these dollars are getting sent to individuals who have a high propensity to spend them. And this is a chart I thought that was pretty interesting in the Wall Street Journal recently. And it talked about, okay, where is inflation showing up? And uh, inflation showing up all in the types of things that we actually want to buy on the left-hand side. And it's all the way from rent to cleaning products, food at home, bicycles. And then on the right, the stuff that we don't have any inflation is really stuff that we don't have any interest in buying right now. And you look at men's suits, airline fares, things like that. Obviously, with the advent of, of some therapeutics, uh, some benefits around vaccines, things like that, you could see this, the, the items on the right start to be uh, a little bit more in demand and you can see inflation starting to pick up. So let's move on now to talk about the virus and, and where things stand, talk about the outlook for fall, winter, rapid testing, and then uh, a vaccine. This chart, uh, what I really want you to focus on is the blue line, which is confirmed cases, which is the, the axis on the left. And so if you see the blue line, when, back in March, there were almost no cases in the United States and that spiked up into April. And through April and May, uh, that's when we started taking the measures to shut things down, people being more vigilant about wearing masks, you saw the numbers starting to come down. Then around mid-June, we saw the big outbreak in the Sunbelt states, Texas, Florida, Arizona primarily, and you see a huge increase in the uh, seven-day moving average of confirmed cases. That number then started to come down as we got through the rest of summer, and it bottomed out in early September, about the time everybody was sending their kids back to school. But where you see it bottomed out, it was at a much higher level than where we were uh, back in June or, or even at the previous peak back in April. And we are on an uptick. And I think that every one of us listening probably now has at least somebody that we know that's had it or, 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 or close contact or somebody who we know that is being affected by it. And I think that the odds of a fall, winter, uh, significant increase, I, I mean, this isn't going out on a limb. I think that it's very clear that we're going to see that and it's going to start to develop. So, that is something that we're going to have to address because the case numbers are going to go higher. And what are you, how are we going to address it from an, from an economic standpoint? I think that the pe people's tolerance or, or patience with another ec economic total shutdown is, is very low. So that's not going to be something that's available. Fortunately, uh, this chart shows us all of the different things that the pharmaceutical companies and the research labs are doing to address COVID. And we have a real-time uh, recent example in terms of how quickly and successfully President Trump was able to, to get past his infection. And I think that has a lot to do with the, the doctors are smarter, the therapeutics that we're able to use are better. Um, and none of that ha has any, uh, and, and all of that will, will continue to get better. And then on a, in addition, there is some continued positive developments around a vaccine. Uh, Pfizer last week said they believe that by early December, they'll have a vaccine available and, and ready. Um, but we also have a few hiccups. AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson had to suspend their trials. So that's going to be the, the nature of it. There's going to be starts and stops. But I 
I think that there's a decent likelihood that sometime next year, we will have some vaccines available that start to address uh, people who don't have the virus and who aren't exhibiting any symptoms and they'll be able to take a, a vaccine and hopefully have some immunity to it. It's not likely that they'll have complete Im immunity, but there will be something. As we move out to 22, 23, et cetera, uh, the, the efficacy of those vaccines I think is gonna pick up significantly. How that relates to investing, this is a chart that Goldman Sachs put together that looks at the correlation in terms of price movement between positive news on a vaccine and how different subsectors of the uh, of the, the S&P 500 perform. And so what you see, I think is very interesting, is the S&P 500 on its own has a slight negative correlation to positive vaccine news. And the reason is, isn't because people don't want that, it's because there's certain parts of the market that have benefited from COVID work from home. And that's at the very bottom, you see the growth component. Those companies that have been able to do well, despite the fact the economy has shut down, um, it's likely that they aren't going to continue to outperform so significantly at the point in time where we have a vaccine. So at the very top, you see value stocks, which have suffered this year, and you've heard us talk about that before and have done very poorly. Uh, value stocks probably will react very positively to uh, uh, vaccine developments and, and even in any treatment developments, anything that allows the economy to reopen and allows people to do more economic activity outside their home. So that's something interesting. We think that it possibly is a tailwind for value in 21, um, but we'll have to have to wait and see. Okay, now the, the topic everybody's really focused on right now is the upcoming election. Um, I've been alive for a number of presidential elections and every single one we're told is the most important election of our lifetime. So we'll, we'll stick with that. I think every time there's an election, somebody tells you that it's the most important election of your lifetime. Here's where um, we're just gonna go through the data. This is presented without, com well, not without comment, but this is how the betting markets right now are handicapping the election. They have Biden as about a 65% likelihood of winning and Trump at 35%. The, uh, going back to 2016, this was closer than that. Between It was forecast that Clinton would win, but I think it was closer to 55-45. So Biden does appear to have a, a little bit more momentum than Clinton did in 2016. But I will tell you, uh, a one out of three odds of winning for, for President Trump, that's not a long shot. And so if he ends up winning, uh, I don't think people should say completely unexpected, out of the blue. It's a, a one in three chance. So they're saying that it's more likely than not that Biden wins, but at the end of the day, I think Trump still has a, has a decent chance. And I will tell you, it does appear that, that uh, Trump's um, uh, standing has been improving in the last week as he's been able to get back out on the campaign trail. This is a, a little different way of looking at the data. This is from a firm called 538, who I think does really good statistical analysis of polls. And a lot of people will tell you polls don't matter because people don't have phones anymore and people lie when they respond. But nonetheless, they analyze the polling data and then they run these Monte Carlo scenarios and they say, okay, well, in each of these scenarios, what are the odds of Biden winning versus Trump? And in those 10,000 runs, 88% of the time Biden wins and 12% of the time Trump wins. I think that the odds of Trump winning are significantly greater than, than uh, one in 10, which this is roughly implying. Um, but I'm gonna show you some data uh, with, which backs up what, what they're saying with regards to the, to the odds. Okay, so we all know that you need 270 votes to win the electoral college system. Doesn't matter how many total votes you get, it only matters in terms of how many states you win. Each state, each candidate starts with a number of locked in votes because there are a lot of states that we just know right now exactly how they're gonna vote. We know California and New York are going for Biden. We know Kansas and Oklahoma are going for Trump. So they, each candidate starts with a certain number of votes. Biden starts with 212, Trump starts with 125. That leaves really 13 states that are deemed competitive. And those 13 uh, are listed over on the right-hand side. And what I've done is I've looked at states where the, based on the, the, the statistical analysis, 
The states that Biden is currently projected to win has an 85% or better chance of winning are shown in the top of this. And you have uh, two states or three states that Clinton won previously, Maine, Nevada, New Hampshire. And then you have the three upper Midwest states, which were crucial for Trump's victory, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Right now, the, the data is saying that Biden is very likely to win these. And if he does win all of these states, then the election is over because that 58 with the 212 will give him the 270 and he would be the next president. I think what we've done though, is we've gone back and looked at, okay, in 2016, for those three Trump states that Trump won, how was Trump doing in the polls compared to how uh, he's doing today? Or, or more accurately, how was Clinton doing in the polls compared to how Biden's doing? And in Michigan and Pennsylvania, Biden's polling numbers are higher than what Clinton's were at the same time in the election in 2016. But what's interesting is that he's actually underperforming, Biden is underperforming where Clinton's polling numbers were in Wisconsin. So I wouldn't be surprised if off of that top list, uh, Trump ends up winning one or maybe more of those states. And it would probably be Pennsylvania and Wisconsin would be the two that appear most likely. Um, and then down below, there are some states that are competitive that Trump won every one of these states down below. And in 2016, Trump also led all of those states in the polling. So none of those were surprises. Even though people felt like it was a big surprise that Trump won in 2016, these states down below, he led in those polls. So it really wasn't a big surprise. Another factor this year that that or factor in 2016 that isn't present this year is Jill Stein, the Green candidate, Green Party candidate, who who definitely siphoned off some votes from Clinton. There isn't a, a meaningful third party candidate this time. So it's going to be an interesting to see um, what happens right now. Biden's leading in in five of those states down below. He clearly isn't going to win all of those, um, but he probably has a decent chance of winning Arizona at this point. And, um, and, and North Carolina actually is becoming much more competitive as well. So I'm going to spend a few, I'm not going to spend any time on the Senate or the House. We have a uh, political analyst on the uh, agenda for you to present uh, to the six morning clients that it's coming up in a couple of weeks. So I'll leave more of that in-depth work to, to him. Now I want to talk about Biden. Uh, what does he want to do? He wants to spend a lot of money and he wants to tax a lot of money. Uh, on the left, we see the areas where he would spend it. And then on the right, we see the areas where he would raise it in terms of taxes. The net impact is about $2 trillion of incremental spending inside the economy. That $2 trillion incremental step up in spending has led Moody's to do an analysis. And they said, um, despite what people might think, a democratic sweep actually would be uh, better for the economy in terms of just the economic size, economic output, because that's a significant amount of stimulus coming into uh, into the economy in a pretty short period of time. So this analysis just looks if it's a Republican sweep, split, or Democratic sweep. And their analysis says with the Democrats, you're going to get a larger economy um, out over the next four to five years. What I thought was interesting was this chart, which looks at uh, whether it's a Trump or a Biden presidency. Uh, for the deficit, which I think does matter at some point in time in terms of how much money do we borrow in order to, to pay our bills, whether Trump wins or Biden wins, the deficit isn't going to have a, much of an impact. And the reason is because Trump will spend less, but he's also going to tax less. So we have a big deficit. Um, he spend less than, than Biden when he still spends a significant, the government still spends a significant amount of money. And then if Biden wins, he will tax a little more, but he's going to spend a little bit more. So Either either way, uh, there's going to be a lot of issuance of treasuries uh, over the next several years, no matter who wins. Well, I want to get into talking about financial markets and the, the recap for 2020 and then a little bit about our outlook. The quickest bear market ever, I think this chart does a great job showing 2020. It was a, a head-turning uh, decline that happened incredibly fast, and then at the same time, the, the, the rebound was equally as impressive and fast. And we wrote a piece about this in, in April, I think, about how long typical bear markets last, and this defied all of that research and all of that data. So for 2020, where do things stand? I've highlighted in red just the year-to-date numbers. The S&P 500 is up 5.6% for the year. Uh, that looks looks like a, a fine year. Below the surface, though, there is a lot of uh, moving pieces, and you see that in the next two line items, the S&P 500 growth and the S&P 500 value. Uh, 
agency growth is up over 20% and value is still down over 11% almost a 30% swing between those two uh, parts of the, of the market. And then if you look at the Russell 2000 down close to 9% and the global stocks excluding the United States still down 5%. So for a diversified investor, uh, I think that 2020 has been a very frustrating year because you see the headlines about the market being up, you see the headlines about certain stocks being up a, a tremendous amount, um, but a diversified portfolio uh, oftentimes is still down for the year. Talking about the growth stocks in more detail in terms of how things have performed, uh, the, the combination of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google is up close to 40% for the year. They all are beneficiaries of work from home and, and transitioning um, to the cloud and, and just technology having a bigger part of all of our lives. And then you see the S&P 500 up 6% for the year, and then the remaining 495 companies are actually down 1% uh, for the year. If we did this graph and showed you the top 10 performers, and then the remaining 490, it would even be more stark, uh, because there are another five companies that are up significant uh, for the year. If you look at stocks like NVIDIA, um, even Home Depot and Lowe's have been up significantly. So there are definitely uh, some very significant winners and some very significant losers so far in the 2020 uh, performance. What that's done is that's led to a high concentration in the S&P 500 amongst the top five and the top 20. And the top five are the same ones from the previous slide. And you see they're approaching 25% concentration uh, in the S&P 500. And then if you look in the top 20 firms, uh, it's over 40, it's approaching 45% concentration. So that's, both of those exceed what we saw at the peak in, of the dot-com bubble. In the dot-com bubble, they're clearly in the S&P 500 were some pretty crummy, uh, junky companies. They're, that's true today as well. There's some crummy, junky companies that probably aren't ever gonna make much money. But when you look at the concentration of the top five, I think this is a, a, a an insightful chart. You look at the current five today, and this chart shows they're 23%, it depends on the day, 23, 25% um, in terms of their concentration. And then you go back to in 2000, and we can see what were the five largest stocks in 2000. They, those stocks made up 18% of the market. You see very quickly that came back down. And by the time we got to 2015, it was only the top five were only about 7% of the market. So it's unusual that you would get this level of concentration. But let's look at who they were in 2000. So you had Microsoft, who was on the list then, and then 20 years later, still one of the, the largest, one of the great companies um, ever created. Then you go to Cisco, uh, GE, Exxon, and Intel. And those two, I'm going to break those into two different buckets. First, we'll start with GE and Exxon. GE and Exxon in 2000, if you were looking at magazine covers, reading stories, those companies, you couldn't fathom that those wouldn't be important big players in the economy 20 years uh, forward in 2020. But both of those stocks uh, in, the, in the last 20 years have gotten kicked out of the Dow Jones Industrial. Their market caps are minuscule. They both have contributed huge, have had huge losses of share value over the last three years. And they're almost irrelevant in, in some regards. I think that if you talk to money managers today about their weightings in GE and Exxon, I, I think they'd look at you like you, uh, uh, like you had just landed from Mars because those are stocks that are just not that important anymore. Then if you look at Cisco and Intel in, in 2000, those were high growth, high PE multiple stocks. And they continue to do well, and they continue to do well today. But what's interesting is those both of those stocks would be classified as value stocks. They both trade at less than 12 times uh, forward PE earnings. They both have pretty good dividend yields, and they're just they're not in the conversation as far as technology leaders. I don't know which of these five in 2020 are going to be the same, but these five stocks in 2040, 20 years uh, from now, are not going to be the five largest stocks in the U.S. stock market. They're just it's just not going to happen. Don't know which ones will remain and which ones will get booted. I don't know which ones will become value stocks, which ones will become irrelevant. But I think that it's uh, that it's something that you have to be aware of and, and consider. This is a chart showing Russell 1000 growth versus value. Uh, it's very extreme. It's not as extreme as it was in 2000, but nonetheless, it's pretty extreme. And 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 for uh, managers that have a diversified mix of different holdings, it's it's felt very extreme. The rally in the market has brought the PE multiple for the S&P 500 back up to uh, close to all-time highs. Um, we're not quite at all-time highs, but very high. And I think that the market has um, a little bit under 
uh, hasn't fully uh, um, accepted a Biden victory and then the increased taxes that he's likely to push through. And if you look at the 2022 S&P 500 EPS, um, it's about a $17 hit uh, to that number. So it's around a 10% decline. And so if all things being equal, if the prices didn't adjust, then you'd see the PE multiple go to even higher levels. So I think that that's something that the market's gonna be uh, worried about and, and paying attention to in 21 post-election. This is a chart also that I think, uh, talk, I talked earlier about the, the cost of the government borrowing money right now, the 10-year treasury note yielding less than 1%. What this chart looks at is four different asset classes or four different securities. The, the NASDAQ, which is QQQ, the Korean ETF, copper price, all three of those are very sensitive to economic growth. And then the U.S. 10-year, which also is sensitive to economic growth because economic growth leads to inflation, which leads to uh, higher interest rates. And you see all of these um, had very similar patterns from the end of 2019 to kind of the market bottom in March. And then the three top ones have all had significant positive price movements for off of that, that, that bottom and the U.S. 10-year has just continued to remain basically at the same levels that it was at when we were in the depths of the recession and people didn't know exactly when it was going to end. I think that this is a coiled spring that is possibly ready to, to explode higher. And so I'd be very cautious about buying new long-term uh, bonds at these prices because I do think uh, coming into 21, we have a chance for those uh, interest rates to move up pretty significantly. This is a chart that just shows real interest rates and you see we're at the lowest levels we really have ever recorded and the real interest rate of negative 1%, meaning if you buy a 10 year treasury right now, you're expected to lose 1% a year for all 10 years. That's not sustainable. Um, maybe that number should be zero. I don't know if you should make any money, but you certainly shouldn't lose money each year. And then this is an interesting chart. It compares what the, the real yield um, at the bottom, um, or at the top, I'm sorry, the real yield of uh, the 10-year treasury to the NASDAQ PE, and you see they have a very tight movement. And so I think that if you saw real interest rates start to move higher, I think that could apply some pressure to the NASDAQ price to earnings ratio. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Um, I've enjoyed getting to, to start meeting with people and, and having uh, interactive conversations with people on Zoom calls. Uh, in summary, for, the, for where we sit today, I put vaccine greater than the election. The election is getting all of the attention, but the most important thing that we could all be paying attention to is when is a vaccine going to be in place and be effectively distributed. That's the, the biggest help to the economy going forward, uh, much more so than the upcoming election. Stimulus with either party and, and the economy definitely needs it. So that's going to happen. It uh, probably isn't going to happen before the election, but it could. Uh, but certainly uh, shortly after the election or shortly after the new president takes uh, the seat, if, if Biden ends up winning, we will get a meaningful stimulus package. Uh, we are in a new economic cycle. Uh, that one was, even though it was very quick, it, it was a, a full cycle of a, of a recession and then a recovery. And the beneficiaries of new economic cycles typically are emerging markets, especially with a vaccine, because it, it helps global growth. Uh, small caps versus large caps, which we've seen over the last several weeks, that, that trade starting to work. And then cyclical stocks and, and to some degree value stocks as well. And then the final point that we're paying attention to and, and that we're, we're cautious on our interest rates. We do see a trajectory that, uh, that those rates could increase in 21 and beyond. Thank you for joining us today and, and uh, we appreciate all of your continued support. We look forward to seeing you soon and please don't hesitate to call if you have any questions.